But we're going to continue our study of 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And as most of you know, I'm fond of calling this 1 Californians chapter 3. And uh, that's more than just a little play on words. The word Corinth wrapped up in their world what we today would wrap up by combining Las Vegas, Hollywood, and New York. And uh, so the, uh, the word Corinth not only meant geography, it also became a term to imply a fornicator. And it's interesting that in many respects in our own society, the, uh, the lack of commitment in marriages and so forth tend to get typified as Californians. So the, the play on words is deliberate, tend to give us a coloration that we might be able to relate to a little better. But uh, I want to start, before we get into our study tonight, just to touch on a piece of background that I think is going to be very crucial to bear in mind. And uh, if we look at John chapter 10, at verse 28, Jesus says, I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. That's quite a statement. He goes on to say, My Father, which gave them me, is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hands. I want you to notice something here, that he says he sh shall never perish. In the Greek, that's a double negative. Now in English, a double negative reverses, but in Greek, it's a way of emphasizing. It makes it more emphatic. They shall never. And so it's especially emphatic. But then he goes on here, uh, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Well, where are we then? In the palm of his hand. But he goes on, my father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my father's hand. I want you to be sensitive here that there are two hands involved, the Lord's hands and the Father's hands. Now, if we're in there, do you think we could get out if we wanted to? See, I don't think so. And uh, so, see, one of the questions that's going to lurk behind many of our thinking is what kind of security is it that offers no security against our own weaknesses? That's a form of weakness that g gives us worry. So, if there is a way for you to lose your salvation once you have it, then I have a new name for God. And that's Butterfingers. And I'm being a little flippant here deliberately because you'll remember that then. But the point of what I want you to do as we approach chapter 3 of 1 Corinthians, I want you to realize that the issue here is not our eternal security. One of the things that I hope you already have done, and if not, I hope you will do, and that's do a very specific study of that issue, eternal security. And uh, we have a, 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 two, a double DVD package on that. You'll discover that your security is committed to by the Father, by the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All three are committed to your security. When you really get into that, it will, I believe, uh, eliminate any anxiety you might have in terms of your personal security. In fact, there are many uh, doctrines that different good scholars have different views on. But this is one, unless you have clarity of this, you can't be effective for him. There's no way you can be a testimony to somebody else if you're not sure of your own position. So it's very, it's very fundamental, very crucial. So we're going to jump into 1 Corinthians 3. Uh, 1 and 2 are very good chapters, very provocative. The foolishness of God and all of that. But chapter 3 zeroes in on the primary reason Paul wrote this letter. He's going to talk about the challenges of what we call carnality. The challenges of carnality. It opens up right away in the first verse. Paul says, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. One of the things that you want to be sensitive to, there are only two categories in the Scripture, from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22. Believers and non-believers. 
Only two. There's no middle ground. And uh, those that are born twice, are, we'll, we'll go into that. Notice he says, and I, he's calling them brethren. I want you to realize that the epistle to 1 Corinthians was written to and regarding Christians. We're not talking about unbelievers here. We're talking about Christians. That's easy to forget as we get into the details here. And uh, brothers equals. It's interesting, the Old Testament prophets never addressed their readers, but admonished them from above. But Paul is right among them. And again, there's only two classes of people from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22, believers and non-believers. And in your notes there, there's a handful of verses from both the Old and New Testament that will, con there is no third class. We need to come to grips with that because it has disturbing implications. And uh, so there's only two categories of scriptures, those that are born once and those that are born twice and are on their way to heaven. And uh, remember now, Paul is speaking to Christians. That's the emphasis. They are sanctified in Christ. We learn in both chapter 1 and chapter 2 that was emphasized. And they receive the Spirit we discovered in chapter 2. So these are issues that are behind us when we get to chapter 3. Just keep it in front of us. And here Paul even calls them brothers. So let's get that context very clear. But within the category of believers, there are two natures, carnal and spiritual. And that's the dilemma that Paul is dealing with here. Carnal, what do we mean by that? Still controlled by the old nature. Failing to make progress in spiritual growth. Sensual and fleshly. So the term carnal is reasonably descriptive. A little old-fashioned, but descriptive. See, maturity here is an eschatological category. It's reached at the time of the resurrection of the dead. From Philippians 3 and other passages. So, I want to dwell on something else. Dr. Earl Rademacher was always famous. When he walked into the classroom, he would announce to his class, I have been saved, I am being saved, and I will be saved. And he said that deliberately to get them confused. What does he mean by that? And that he's talking about the fact that the word salvation has some ambiguities we need to deal with. It's actually a, a, a term that has three tenses a past, present, and future tense. And so, the para, I'm going to deal with it like a paradigm of a verb. The paradigm of salvation. Okay, the past tense of salvation is called justification. What do I mean by that? Justification is a gift of God of everlasting life by faith alone in Christ alone. Period. That's it. It's a gift. You can't earn it. It was paid for by the Lord Jesus. It's a gift from God of everlasting life. Received how? By faith alone and in Christ alone. He did it all. To try to add to that is blasphemy. Justification. No problem there. The present tense of salvation we call sanctification. That's a different thing altogether. That's a work in progress that involves faith and works of the believer. All of us in this room are works in progress. He's not finished with any of us. We are all in a process of sanctification, hopefully. <laughs> but then, of course, the future tense of salvation, for lack of another name, I'll call glorification. And that's the result of the previous aspects. You with me so far? Let's go at this. All believers will be glorified, that is, resurrected and given a body like Christ. But some will have more glory than others. More reward. And that is amazingly controversial. It's amazing. There's some major, major biblically oriented groups that think everybody's equal. And they find great offense in the suggestion that everybody in heaven is not equal. Jesus went to some great lengths to emphasize that. And we're going to be hitting that head on as we go here. So we have the past tense of salvation. That's separation from the penalty of sin. And we call that justification. The present tense is separation from the power of sin. And we call that sanctification. And the third tense, the future tense, is separation from the very presence of sin. Past tense, separation from the penalty of sin. Jesus did that on a cross 2,000 years ago. Done deal. Completed. Present tense, separation from the power of sin. That's a day-to-day -day struggle that you and I face every day. 
moment by moment. The future tense will be the separation from the very presence of sin. And that's devoutly to be wished. Hmm? Glorification. Justification. That's why we try not to use the word salvation because it's too fuzzy. Justification, sanctification, glorification. All three of them describe the past, present, and future tense of what we collectively call salvation. That's the suggestion. And I hope that's helpful. Justification is for us. Sanctification is in us. Justification declares the sinner righteous. Sanctification makes the sinner righteous. Justification removes the guilt and penalty of sin. Sanctification removes the growth and power of sin. The very distinctive aspects of what we call collectively call salvation. Now, something else that you should study when you as you get at it: salvation itself involves all three persons of the Godhead. We call Christ as our Redeemer, and He certainly is. But all three persons of the Godhead are involved. The Father's electing grace, the Son's loving sacrifice, the Spirit's ministry of conviction and regeneration. So Paul, now we get down to verse 2. We're making progress here tonight. Paul says, I have fed you with milk and not with meat. For hitherto ye were not able to bear it. Neither yet now are ye able. He's giving them a scolding here. He calls them babes in Christ. If somebody says dada, that's cute for a one-year-old, but it's embarrassing for an 18-year-old. And he's, he's arguing that they haven't matured. They're still back at square one. They should have gone far beyond that. This language he's using is reminiscent of uh, Hebrews 5, which deals with the same issue. And Paul develops that in depth in Hebrews 5. Now, by the way, is Paul the author of Hebrews? I absolutely believe. I think you can prove it, despite some scholastic debate. The three epistles by Paul are a trilogy on Habakkuk 2.4, the just shall live by faith. Who are the just? Romans chapter 1 verse 17 quotes Habakkuk 2.4 and answers that question, who are the just? And it's the, it's the epitome of, that, of, of, of the epistles in that regard. How are they then to live? That's Galatians 3.11. Again, it's quoted and it describes how we're to live. And then, of course, they're to live by faith in Hebrews 10.38 a verse, uh, just a verse or two before the famous Hall of Faith. In the, the main point of this, I think, is that all three epistles, Romans, Galatians, and Hebrews, are clearly a trilogy designed by Paul on, or the Holy Spirit, on the trilogy of Habakkuk 2.4. So I'll leave that to you to, to study and come to terms with. But we'll continue with verse 3. Paul says, For ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? And so, see, the natural man can be learned, gentle, eloquent, fascinating, but the spiritual content of Scripture is absolutely hidden from them. We need to understand that. You can run into very bright intellectual people that are very lovable, very attractive in many ways, but they can be totally blind to spiritual truth because they're still in the carnal nature. The Christian is able to comprehend only the simplest truths or the milk, if you will, the early Christians. So you're yet carnal. And the word sarkonos is fleshly or essence thereof. In verse 3, it's a very similar word. And uh, it's in contrast to sukakos, the senses, and uh, pneumatikos, the spiritual or reborn or spirit-filled. But um, he asks, are you not carnal? That's Paul's question. If that means natural or are you unspiritual, so to speak? And the ISV would call it still worldly. New Revised Standard says of the flesh. Uh, the New Jerusalem Bible, natural inclinations. The New American Bible, in, in a natural condition. Not spiritually minded. And uh, not merely in, on the natural plane, controlled by the fallen nature. Those are all ways of saying pretty much the same. You're, being, you're still in the world, in effect. Now the real point here, Paul is pointing out, there appears to be no discernible difference in conduct between them and the unsaved. Whoops! Does that describe us? Is there a discernible difference in our conduct from those that are unsaved? They often ask, if you were on trial for being a Christian, is there enough, is there enough evidence to convict you? <laughs> the world can't tell that we 
are Christians, or they are Christians, and I'm putting the we in there. Because what Paul is saying to the carnal Christians of, of uh, Corinth may be applying to us here. We need to see if the shoe fits. They, that is we, are filled with jealousy and strife, all kinds of examples, devoid of love for one another, how guilty we are of that from time to time. These people have a holier than thou attitude, spiritual pride, separistic, contentious. Those are all things that are undesirable. And this, this is the very message that got to Paul from Chloe's household that caused him to write this epistle. He says, for, one, for while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Paulus, are ye not carnal? And it was those very messages from, from the household of, of uh, Chloe. Full circle. Paul rebukes their lack of maturity, and he encourages them to grow in grace and knowledge, faith and love and holiness. That's basically the gist of both this and Peter's two letters. Who then is Paul, or who is Apollos? But ministers of whom he believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. See, a Christian worker is never to be idolized. Only Christ should receive glory and honor. You need to be very careful about it. I know many of you try to encourage me in various ways, and you mean well, but be very careful of that. Because it's Christ that gets the glory, not, not the workers here. And uh, there is a, something else that needs to be talked about here, and that's the concept of the Nicolaitans, the people who are men of the cloth. That's a concept that had been adapted from paganism. And what's astonishing is that from the third century on, that format has in, 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 infused itself into our religious world. The whole concept of the laity and the clergy is laitanism, and Jesus hates that. Twice in his letters, in his seven letters, twice, he points out he hates the Nicolaitans. This idea that you're a man of the cloth. No, 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 no. And uh, we need to understand that. So uh, it's interesting, uh, Walter Martin was a very close friend. I was on his board, and he had a very difficult ministry. He had a, a counter-cult ministry which is a very tricky thing to manage in the first place. But Walter had a very key uh, policy. He never attacked a person. He would attack what they published in contrast to what the Bible said. That kept him on solid ground. With only one minor exception, did he ever attack an ad hominem or a person. It was always the, the published assertion in contrast to the Bible. And that kind of diligence is what kept him out of trouble for many decades. And so... A pastor is not a minister of a particular church, but a minister of Christ's gospel. Pastors are servants, table waiters, if you will. And we need to keep that in front of us. Now, by the way, Apollo, and Paul mentions Paul and Apollos and others. Those, mention, those names are mentioned three times, but always in a different order. Because he, he's trying to de-emphasize any particular one. And he does that by the, he focuses, he wants to focus on the work, not the person. And we're going to be talking about the work, not the person, when we get to 11, 12, and 13, the, the core of this epistle. And anyway, we can, in verse 6, Paul says, I have planted and Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So there again, both Apollos and Paul were instrumental, and yet it's God that gives the increase and should get the glory. The Greek verbs here, by the way, indicate that the work of Paul and Apollos was in the era's tense. It was completed. But the work of God was imperfect, continuous. It's never completed. It's always continuing. Even in the subtlety of the Greek verbs, we find those things emphasized. Verse 7, So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Fair enough. And... Uh, the word theos, or God, stands last in the Greek uh, structure of the sentence, which where you get the emphasis at the end. That's a little different. That structure is different than English. Now, he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. And uh, it's interesting. Uh, someone's pointed out in higher mathematics, zero plus zero plus zero is still zero. So that's the, the workers. 
But if you put a one in there, zero plus zero plus one, Christ is the only one, is the idea. But you want to put the one first, because that makes one, one zero zero, that's a, a million times more than if you go point zero 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 one. So you always put Christ first. It, someone just played around with that, and it's a cute little thing. But anyway, the main point is individuality is a factor God does not overlook. And rewards are the result of faithfulness. They are not the reason for nor the goal of a service labor. So let's get that out of the way. Many people have hesitated to teach or study rewards for fear of an improper emphasis. No, Jesus emphasizes a great deal. We're going to plunge right into the middle of this subject. We want to understand that. Okay. And Paul refutes, by the way, in all of this, the notion that he and Cephas and Apollos were at variance or rivals. And there's more verses on that that we'll get before the, the uh, first Corinthians is finished. But let's move on to verse 9. For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. And uh, see, without him we can't, but without us he won't. He has chosen to accomplish his work through us. And uh, that's, uh, that's astonishing. And that's what he's chosen to do. So Paul continues, according to the grace of God which is given unto me, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. Ooh, there's a caution there. Let every man take heed. That's a solemn warning. See, we are God's building. We're only subcontractors. And so... What you need to do, though, to put this into pragmatics, is you need to find out what your gifts are and then go ahead and apply them. If you're not apply, applying your gifts, you're defrauding the body. But now we get right to it here. We're moving into the core of this whole epistle. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. No surprise there. The foundation has been laid by Jesus Christ. I think we're all... That's a good place to, that's where we start. And no theologian or council or committee can change the gospel without incurring God's wrath. It's astonishing to realize how many people running churches are very careless about that. That they ignore what is really the gospel in exchange for pursuing social justice issues. Not that those issues aren't legitimate issues, but they compete with what the calling is, is to deal with the gospel. And let's not get confused on that point. Now we get right to it in verse 12. 1 Corinthians 3.12 Now, if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, or wood, hay, and stubble, I want you to notice here we've got six things in two groups. Gold, silver, precious stones, and wood, hay, stubble. Two different groups. Six commodities, two groups, in descending order of worth. It starts with the best and ends with the worst. With me so far? Three are products of a creative act. Gold, silver, precious stones were created by God. Wood, hay, stubble are products of growth and development. Uh, and so, the old nature, if you will. So we're going to see that three of them are, are prized and three of them are cast off. See, they're all building on the same foundation, but with vastly different results. That's the concept that's going to come through here. Okay. The first three are permanent, gold, silver, precious stones. They don't wear out. The second three will perish. They're designed to perish. Wood, hay, stubble. See the contrast. Many people, as they read that, don't pick up the fact there's two distinct groups here. The largest load of any hay or wood may be worth less than the smallest diamond. So you've been saved. Praise God. What have you done with it? You see, we're all heading for a final exam. Most of us that study eschatology are all excited about the rapture. Rapture is this, aren't we excited? Just hardly wait and so forth. Wait a minute. What's the thing that happens immediately after the rapture? The Bema Seat of Christ. We have a final exam. Everybody present will be saved. That's why they're there. But they're all going to have a final exam. 
The other thing I want to clarify, clarify some other confusion about the term bima seat. That's a Greek term. And somehow some people argue that the bima seat was just for the giving of rewards. That's not true. It may be the primary truth in the one we're talking about, but the point of the word bema seat was a tribunal seat, a judicial bench, a judgment seat or throne. Herod Agrippa I addressed the people of Tyre and Sion from the bema seat. Jesus was brought before Pilate, who was on the, his bema seat. Paul was accused before the proconsul of Gallio uh, in Acts 18, and that relic is still around. No, the, the Bema seat is exactly what you think it is. It's the throne. It's the judgment seat for whatever's going on. It happens that the one we're going to focus on is where Jesus is offering rewards. But don't see that as any diminution of authority here. Paul was brought before Festus at Caesarea at the Bema seat in Acts 25. Now let's talk a little bit about the order of events. That's not the primary subject of this thing, but it's a little background review here. I think most of us who study eschatology understand the central role of the 70th week of Daniel is a definitive time. And we are at the end of an interval between the 69 weeks and the 70th, an extended interval in Daniel 9.26. But we're heading for the 70th week as described in Daniel 9.27, the last verse of that chapter. And of course we're looking for the Harpazo, which we believe for a number of reasons occurs prior to the 70th week. Not necessarily immediately before. Many people who make their charts uh, link those together. No, there's a, a space of indefinite duration between the Harpazo and the beginning of the 70th week. Let's keep that in mind. It might be one hour, might be 30 years, we don't know. But the main point is the 70th week, as you know, it's divided right in the middle by an event called the Abomination of Desolation, worthy of very careful study. And that splits that 70th week into two halves. Each half is labeled as three and a half years, 42 months, or 1260. Holy Spirit did everything he could to make sure that that didn't get allegorized. Okay. In fact, those two halves were named, one of them, the second one, was named by the, per, by the Lord Jesus himself as the Great Tribulation. It's, notice it's three and a half years, not seven years. Everybody calls them, speaks of the seven-year tribulation. They're being sloppy. What they mean is the 70th week of Daniel is seven weeks. Fine. But the Great Tribulation is the, definitively the last half of that seven-year period. And, of course, it gets climaxed in Armageddon, which is interrupted by the second coming of Jesus Christ. That's why we have that so clearly in our studies. Okay. And when Jesus comes back, Satan is bound. He's not destroyed. His two buddies, the two beasts of Revelation 13, are cast into the pit. But Satan is just bound for a thousand years, strangely enough. Okay. And that starts a period of a thousand year reign by Jesus Christ called the millennium. And it's not just because it shows up in Revelation. It's all through Isaiah and elsewhere. Most of what we know about it comes from Isaiah, not Revelation. And there's a couple of periods that scholars uh, ponder, 1290 days and 1335. We don't have to get into that here. But right about that time is also another judgment of the sheep and goats. And we'll talk about that a little bit here in a minute. At the end of the millennium, this is not to scale, obviously, um, Satan is released, and that's where we have a final rebellion. Satan's released, and Gog and Magog the second time occurs again. And so that, of course, is, uh, is Jesus comes back, deals with that, and the great white throne judgment wraps that all up and leads to a new heavens and a new earth. It's interesting that even the heavens are redone. The earth, the earth redone, no surprise, but even heaven is redone, strangely enough. And of course, we have then the uh, New Jerusalem and all of that. Now, there are three judgments that get confused. The first judgment is the one we, wanna, we, we are going to encounter in 1 Corinthians 3. The Bema Seat judgment. Everybody there will be saved. It's the first thing that occurs after the Harpazo, apparently. We're raptured, we're in heaven, great. Whatever's going on on the earth is going on, but we are going to be in a final exam. That's 2 Corinthians 5.10 to really get into the details of it. Now, that's a very important thing to understand because the primary thing you and I should be focusing on is our ability to improve our 
position in that final exam. Every day that goes by, we can improve our situation. The other thing that occurs in the father's house during that period is the marriage of the lamb. And then uh, not to be confused with the wedding supper. The marriage supper is on the earth. John the Baptist will be there and uh, the friend of the bridegroom and so on. It was, I think we're indebted to Arnold Fruchtenbaum who really clarified that those two things are separate in separate locations. The marriage takes place in the father's house. The marriage supper is in the kingdom. And, uh, but the main point, we have the Mima seat, the sheep and goat judgment. Very, the more you study that, the more questions it raises. And then, of course, you have the great white throne. Those three judgments are very, very different from one another. And you need to make, take some effort to understand the distinctions here. And uh, the Bema Seat of Christ is the one we're focusing on. It's all about rewards, crowns, and assignments. And that's where the kingdom parables, the talents, the virgins, and the uninvited guests all deal with that. It's the call to the bride, to the marriage of the Lamb. Then we have the sheep and goat judgments, which is from Matthew 25. It's on the earth, strangely enough, and there's three separate parties involved. The sheep and the goats and Christ's brethren, Israel. And so very, the more you study it, the more questions it raises, because mortals are judged on the basis of works. That's a disturbing issue. And of course, the great white throne at the end in Revelation 20 is the big wrap-up. The end of the millennium, the unsaved dead, and so forth. Then we have the new heavens, new earth, new Jerusalem, and so on. Something else that emerges in all this are five crowns. There's five crowns that have specific names. One of the crown of righteousness in 2 Timothy 4, the crown of glory in 1 Peter 5, the um, crown of life in Revelation 2, the incorruptible crown in 1 Corinthians 9, and the crown of rejoicing in 1 Thessalonians 2. Now, this might be four, five different descriptions of the same crown, or there might be five, five distinct crowns. So most people tend to look at it that way. There might be 20 crowns. These are just the five that are mentioned. So I wouldn't make too much of it, but there are specifically five definitive allusions here. And uh, so the question is, what would you do with these when you, if you earn them? What happens to them if you earn them? What happens if you're going to cast them on the glassy sea before the throne of God? Well, let's continue where we left uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 12. Now, if any man build on this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, or wood, a stubble, notice now, here's a verse that most people misunderstand. Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. Notice what's being burned is not the guy, his work. See, it's a way of evaluating the work. And, uh, and if you, instead of using the word work, substitute the concept of fruit bearing, it makes a lot more sense. Okay. The guy is, and he goes, it'll be clarified in the next verse to make sure you don't misunderstand. But I want you to understand, every, every, everybody's work is going to be evaluated. And some of it will stand and some of it will not. Because they're going to, the fire is the, the metaphor being used to, to separate the two. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereon, he shall receive a reward. Wow. So he's going to get rewarded if his work stands the test. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But notice the next phrase so you don't misunderstand. But he himself shall be saved, yet so is by fire. Okay. See, whatever you've done for Christ will remain. Everything else will burn. And, uh, but you need to understand, this has nothing to do with his salvation. His salvation has been taken care of before he even gets to this, this stage. But the work that he's committed himself to, if, a, if it's done by the Holy Spirit, in accordance with God's plan, he will be rewarded. Because his fruit bearing will stand to his credit. If, by chance, what he's committed himself to is uh, not what God has ordained, it'll be burned, and he'll suffer loss. Loss in the sense he, he won't get the reward he would have gotten if it had stayed. But in either case, it's not his salvation that's at issue. Have I over... Is that clear? I'm getting a lot of blank stares. I hope that's... Okay. 
Let me distinguish rewards here. Salvation is invariably expressed as a free gift, not rewards. Salvation is a free gift. And there's several verses there for your perusal. Rewards are earned by works. I'm going to call that fruit bearing. And there's lots of verses on that one. Salvation is a present possession. Your salvation is something you have right now. It isn't rewarded later. You've got it now. Because Jesus took care of it 2,000 years ago on a cross in Judea. Rewards are a future attainment given by him at his coming. See the difference? Your salvation you have now. The rewards you may be entitled to will be something of the future. Let me use a lot as an example. Lot was vexed daily, Peter tells us. Abraham was not vexed. He had separated himself from the world. God destroyed Sodom but saved Lot, yet as by fire. In other words, he got out of there, but like he, he, he's like a refugee. Everything he had was burned up. Okay? Remember that in Peter, uh, Peter 2.8, 2 Peter 2.8. For that righteous man dwelling among them in seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deed. So Lot was vexed, but he's right in the middle of it because he, stay, he, he stuck around there. A lot of people do that today, by the way. They stay with a denomination they're uncomfortable with, or they stay in politics that they're not, whatever. And they're, they hate it. It's fruitless. And they stay there. That raises a question. I, I wouldn't try to pre presume to advise, but it deserves some serious prayer. Because uh, Lot finally got out of there. Everything he had lived for was burned up. And many people are in that situation. Everything they're working for is destined to be for nothing. That which is done for the sake of personal gain, for popularity, for influence, or its impression on the world will be for naught. That's not what God's interested in. Okay? Our greatest joy should be winning souls. And not just winning them, their sustained growth. That's been probably our major burden for four decades. Someone accepts Christ, praise God, then what? What happens next? How does he grow? How do, you know, the, the biblical illiteracy in most pulpits are the problem. So that's the edification ministry of the Koine Institute. We're not really an evangelistic organization. Oh, we're glad to lead people to Christ. That's not the point. Our primary focus, though, is, a, is to deal with people who have decided to take him seriously. There's a lot of debates in, among our leadership here. A lot of, many people like to say, gee, KI, Coin Institute, is for everybody. It's certainly not excluding anybody. But that's not what it's for. It's really for those who are really serious. It's a place where people who are really serious can go because, surprisingly, there's very few places they can. And so, let's move on here. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God? Ooh, that's quite a phrase. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God? He's going to deal with that again in chapter 6 in depth. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? That don't you know? You know ye not. That's a rhetorical question used ten times in this letter as a form of mild rebuke. Don't you know? Didn't you know that? Ye are the temple of God. Now, for a detailed study of this aspect, I encourage you to look at our little briefing pack called The Architecture of Man, or even better yet, study the, the, uh, take the studies in the textbook that my wife has published, The Way of Agape. Of all the things I've seen, it's, it does the most thorough job at exploiting this very concept, that you're the temple of God. And if you take the tabernacle, I assume you all study that, you're familiar with it, and... Uh, we have the, the, the core of the temple proper, of course, uh, is what most people zero in on. But there is the laver and the altar of sacrifice outside. But as you look at that, you discover that there's a holy place and the holy of holies, with the menorah and the, you have the table of showbread, the golden altar, associated with, but just outside of the holy of holies. In the holy of holies, you got two things that are separately defined, the Ark of the Covenant 
and the mercy seat are separate, one sitting on top of the other, but don't confuse them. One has a future, one doesn't. And we can, that's a whole other study that we deal with. And so, now, Jesus made claim on every one of these things. He says, I am the door. I am the light of the world. I am the bread of life. I am the intercession. And he's our sin bearer and our propitiation. Each one of these things are personified in Yeshua. Now that's the Old Testament version of it. You have the Holy Holies and you have the, uh, the Holy Place. And the, new, the uh, Solomon's Temple is a little different because you had an inner court in the Holocaust altar and the Molten Sea. But what's strange about it, you also had um, an outer court and you also had two, two pillars that had names, Yachin and Boaz. They didn't hold up anything. They're there symbolically. Why? And there's a porch included, and uh, that where people, that's where decisions were made. And then you've got a personal storage for the priests, where priests hid their idolatrous terms. Each one of these things are analyzed in practical spiritual terms in, in uh, the way of Agape and subsequent books. So, But if any man defile the temple of God, ooh, if you're the temple of God, can you be defiled? Well, if any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Well, that gets kind of scary when you realize you're, if you abuse yourself in ways that are inappropriate, uh, that's a crime against God. Let you chew on that for a little bit. That's a little scary. Factors that can destroy God's temple were present when Paul was writing this epistle. Those who are devoid of God's spirit. Now our sufficiency in Christ, let's keep, we keep that clear. We have forgiveness for past sins, that's righteousness. We have strength for the present, sanctification, and we have hope for the future. All in Christ. Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. That sounds like the earlier chapters, remember? Warnings against self-deception by enthralled worldly wisdom. In other words, do not deceive yourselves is another way to summarize this. That's the present imperative verb used here nowhere else. And so, the ultimate barrier to truth, the ultimate barrier to truth is the presumption you already have it. And that's the challenge for all of us. Now, I love the old Persian proverb. I couldn't resist throwing it in here. He who knows and knows not that he knows is asleep. Wake him. He who knows not and knows that he knows not is a student. Teach him. He who knows not and knows not that he knows not is a fool. Shun him. He who knows and knows that he knows is wise. Follow him. I like that. But moving on. For the wisdom of the world is foolishness with God, for it is written, He taketh the wise in their own craftiness. Do you see how this ties into... Chapter 1 and chapter 2. This puts a ribbon on it in a sense of speaking. It's an echo of the foolishness of God thing. Take the wise and own craftiness. And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise that they are vain. And uh, now the, 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 uh, Paul replaces the of the wise uh, of the men when he quotes the psalm, but that's all right. Arrogant men boast that they are safe because the Lord neither sees nor pays attention. You've got to be kidding. You've got to be kidding. A little boy asks his grandpa, does God, does God know what I, do, what, what, what I do when no one's around? He says, God loves you so much he can't take his eyes off you. <laughs> I like that. Anyway, such opinions, of course, are obviously vain and foolish. Let therefore no man glory in them, for all things are yours. And uh, pretty straightforward. Everything in the earth belongs to God. All things are yours. Two words. Those are two words in the Greek. Whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours. And ye are Christ's and Christ is God's. Wow. Does that remind you of another passage? It's not like Romans 8. I can't resist going there. World, life, death, present, future. Five ultimate tyrannies of human existence to which people are in lifelong bondage as slaves. And so, 
Christ made the world, redeemed it, upholds it, and appoints the people as to be the stewards in it. But that leads, in my mind, an excuse I can use to go to what I like to call the ultimate tour de force. And that's seven questions that Paul raises and answers that concludes the eighth chapter of his epistle to the Romans. Romans 8, 31 to 39. Seven questions. The first two basically ask him the opposition defeat the Christian. Okay, well, let's take a look at that. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against it? That's really two questions, the first two questions. The if is a first class conditional. We would translate that since, not if God, since God be for us. See, there's, in Greek, there's four conditions. The first condition is what we would more properly translate as since, but okay. Obviously, Satan and his demonic hosts are against all believers, no surprise. But they cannot ultimately prevail and triumph over believers. God is the self-existent sovereign creator. Since he is for believers, no one can oppose believers successfully. That's the premise that's going to be developed here. Okay. And will we, the next question is, will we have the resources? Okay. He that even spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? And uh, both the King James and the RV failed to translate the Greek particle even. He that even spared, they don't, that's not in your King James, but it should be. He that even spared not his own son. And, uh, and the same word is used in the Septuagint and so forth. Remember, Abraham never withheld his son was the whole point. And God offered his own son on that very spot as a sacrifice for sin. And since God sacrificed his own son, he will not hesitate to give believers all things pertaining to and leading to their ultimate sanctification. Will our failures reverse our justification? That's one of the questions we raised when we opened this chapter. Well, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. And the charge is a formal accusation in court is a term there. Satan is identified as the accuser of God's people. His accusations are valid because they are based on the believer's sinfulness and defilement. Satan's accusations will be thrown out of court because it is God who justifies. The accused person is righteous on the basis of his faith in Jesus Christ. And as a result, all accusations are dismissed and no one can bring an accusation that will stand. Okay, then can anyone condemn us for any reason at all? That's the next question. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. See, Jesus is God's appointed judge. Jesus is whom the believer has trusted for salvation. Furthermore, he's the one who died, more than that, who was raised to life, that is at the right hand of God. And he is presently, right now, interceding for us. Wow is right. That's the... Having justified the ungodly, God will, will not and cannot contradict himself by charging them with evil. Who is he that condemneth? 30, verse 30 sources. Paul gives four answers, each of which are taught elsewhere in the scripture, but are gathered here to underscore the unconditional security of the believer. Christ died, that he is risen, that he advocates, and that he intercedes. Four specific answers. Okay. If God has already justified the man who believes in Jesus, how can he lay anything to the charge of his already justified one? His justification comes from the imputed righteousness of Christ and is legally ours. It is not the subject of merit. It cannot be lost by demerit. Get that. That's important. It's not a subject of merit. Therefore, you can't lose it by demerit because you didn't merit it in the first place. Like a father, God can and does correct his earthly sons, but they always remain sons. That's the lesson of the prodigal son. He may have blown his inheritance, but he never lost his sonship. What kind of assurance can we have in a victory? I love this. This is the big wrap-up. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? 
the, the apostle suggested seven setbacks a believer might experience. And Paul experienced all of them. We'll see it in 2 Corinthians 11. And uh, seven setbacks. And I won't go through each one of these. Tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, or sword. They're all, they're all there. They're all dealt with, all listed. As is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are what? More than. You ought to make a collection of the more thans in Paul's letters. And in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. So, in all these adverse, rather than being separated from Christ's love, believers are more than conquerors. And this is present tense, mean keep on being conquerors to a greater degree. Or keep on winning a glorious victory. See, the, the present tense is important through him that loved us. Okay. But his final guarantee, this is the final wrap up here, his final guarantee. For I'm persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, or any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's his final guarantee. Praise his name. Perhaps it includes angels, principalities, demons, what have you. You have nothing, you've nothing to fear. The powers of darkness, <laughs> what else is there? And so, this should reprioritize our outlook on everything. On everything, daily, hourly. The 16th century theologian Zacharias Eusenus, what is your only comfort in life and death? That I am not my own, I belong body and soul in life and death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. But don't forget, the other thing you want to carry away from these discussions is the Christian's bar of soap. 1 John 1, 9. Let's always remember, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What a precious verse that is. You might want to mark it, put it on your bathroom mirror or whatever. That's the Christian's bar of soap. Okay. Well, for the next session, I want you to read the entire epistle, 1 Corinthians. No problem. Not a big deal. But study carefully chapter 4. We'll zero in on chapter 4 next time. And, uh, and with that, we'll conclude our exploration of... First Corinthians, First Californians, chapter three, and uh, let's do that with a word of prayer. Let's bow our hearts.